That's a bird emergency. We're doing a bit of a quick update on this little episode. I'm Grant Williams. I'm a bird nerd. Joining me right there is Kylie Sones. And Kylie's Kylie's a scientist with a special interest in urban biodiversity and has been working on something that I've always been interested in. How do we get more nest boxes into the environments where we've spent 100 years 150 years getting rid of all of the old awful untidy trees that have spaces for wildlife to live in how do we undo the damage hi kylie thanks for checking in with us yeah thanks kylie we'll just focus we'll concentrate on replacing habitat that's been lost specifically opportunities for nesting and roosting those animals particularly birds that need hollows. What have you been working on that's been making a bit of a difference in our cityscapes? Yeah, I've got a, I'm lucky enough that I've got a few good projects on the go, both about trying to protect the big old habitat trees that we already have because we know how important that is because we know how long they take to replace once they're lost. In many gum trees, it's 300 years plus before they even start to provide good real estate in terms of hollows for the animals that we need. So ways that we can protect and keep the trees that we have, ways that we can look to trees that originally maybe we we skipped over. So a lot of our non-native street trees actually provide hollows that wildlife can use, especially critters like possums and red-rumped parrots. And traditionally we would have just gone, oh no, that's a plain tree, there's nothing valuable there. But sometimes these can offer novel habitats. And I guess the third thing is how do we get our hands dirty and actually make these new habitats ourselves? And I have an excellent PhD student who is trying to think outside the box a little bit and create structures that cater to some of our more picky wildlife in terms of what kind of hollows that they need. Okay, who's picky and and how are you getting... Or how are you catering to those f- f- wildlife with a fetish? <laughs> yes, the fussy ones, uh, the wicked problems. So often the really hard ones are the big ones. So in Melbourne we have powerful owls, which are as powerful as their name suggests. They're really large. But this means that they need big hollows, like enormous hollows that can fit an owl that's, you can't even see my hands, close to half a metre bigger, high, and the young that they want to raise. That requires a lot of space. And trying to build a nest box that can fit all of that space and not be so heavy that we can't even get it up a tree in the first place is really difficult. So some of the amazing people that work in the School of Design and Architecture are thinking a bit more about animals as clients. What kind of Design features do they need in their house? What kinds of materials that we can use other than uh, heavy wood in a box with a hole cut in it that might allow us to have structures that are lighter, easier to place in the trees, big enough for the species and better mimic the ecology of a hollow, have all those nooks and crannies and delightful little design features that wildlife need? That's a really good approach. How did the approach or the contact with the architecture students happened? Were they, like, that client-focused, that end-user-focused process is one that is kind of, it's pretty unique. Like, people have always said, here's a nest box, now use it. Does it need to be bigger? Does it need to be smaller? What size should the hole be and where should it be? Yeah. So... So did you or some of your students approach architecture students or working architects to to solve the problem or did they come to you with hey we think we could do something here how did that come about yeah they came to us so there are heaps of architects and designers that are thinking about ecological problems all the time and what was really interesting to us is once we eventually met up and started working together is that we've both been traveling alongside tackling the same problem but coming from different perspectives and once we're able to work together and get all of those perspectives working on the same problem it's just opened up a whole lot more opportunities so i can work with them to bring in 
more ecological background and an urban ecology science. And they have this way of thinking about animals as clients and the kinds of materials and techniques, really advanced computer-aided design and manufacturing and 3D printing that as an ecologist, it's just not anything that's ever occurred to me. So it's allowed us to really explore a new space and a new way of thinking about this. And if we're brutally honest about it, architect firms have actual human clients who've got a lot more money than anybody working in the conservation space. So, And it's nice that maybe some of the developers that have been originators of problems perhaps in the past can now be solvers of problems, especially in the urban and suburban environments. Yeah, absolutely. Science, engineering, architecture, all of these disciplines are about solving problems and finding the right solution. But we just all have different skill sets and different backgrounds. So but being able to work together, it's, it's been really exciting, difficult at times because you feel like you're speaking an entirely different language, but really exciting. I think it's worth pointing out that having an architect specifically design a hollow that needs to be 3D printed in a specific way, that's not always going to be the solution. Nest boxes, when they do work, are a perfectly good solution but there are some species that they're just not being successful for i think for a powerful owl there are no records of successful nesting and in some cases they're getting so desperate to try and find ways that we can create artificial hollows for them that they were using old rubbish bins like that's the size that we're talking and trying to convert them into something that an owl would use that to me is probably not an ideal solution and if we can come up with a way to build something that's sustainable and it meets all the needs that the owl has as well as being able to fit well to the tree and this is something in an urban environment if you're going to be sticking great big heavy things up in trees and there's a risk of falling councils are not really keen on that either are the people that have to walk underneath them so the beautiful thing about the way that these nest boxes are designed is that they're also designed to specifically mold to the trees in their environment. So they don't need to be nailed in. They don't have a lot of hooks and braces and heavy equipment. They actually sit quite neatly on the branch structure of the specific tree that they were designed for, which makes them really handy in an urban environment because then the tree doesn't get damaged as well. We've missed the marketing opportunity there. They're not <laughs> handy. They're not handy. They're, they're bespoke. They're bespoke. They're bespoke. <laughs> right. So... What's the advance? We've talked about the design a little bit, and I want to come back to that in in a minute if we can. But what's the advantage in terms of materials working with people in design and construction? Something you've been using something new. Tell us about that. Yeah, look, the, I'm going to be honest, the, the specifics of the materials is starting to get right on the edge of my knowledge, but we tried two different designs and one was sort of 3D printed wood in these little Lego cubes, basically, that, that fit together and can be assembled really well without adhesives or nails or anything like that. And the other one is hempcrete, which is a material that I certainly have never worked before, but I think for me, the benefit of working with um, people who are expert and aware of all these different materials is we can try and look for something that's cost effective and that insulates really well, that's porous and drains really well, that's non-toxic and also sustainable in the long term. We can design things that have a longer lifespan than a traditional nest box and also when they break down, they're not leaving harmful plastics or wastes and they're the kinds of things that we're trying to think about a little bit more now than we traditionally have with taking the bespoke path where you and you're able to deal with people with high computer-aided design skills to be really to really n nail down to really zoom in on certain design features has that aided in keeping pest species out of of the boxes we're all we're We've always talked about the common miner, the Indian miner, yep. and starlings and, and, and sparrows making big fire traps because they pull in so much grass. But does it mean that you can really nail down a box that 
for instance, owls, particular owls, but that you can keep cockatoos and lorikeets out of? That's a really good question. It's not something that we've tackled yet, and we've only been able to put out a handful of these bespoke designer hollows for a little while so far. So we don't have the data to really look at that, but it certainly is something that you could start to bring in. The way that we've tried to keep species out of traditional nest boxes, we've We've tried so many creative things, putting carpet on the inside or baffles or hidden entrances that are this way or that way or the other. Some people swear by having it sloped on this much of an angle facing an east wind. We're trying so many different ways. This is just, just one more thing that we can try to make sure that the things that we're designing are being used by the species that need them the most. And then there's the question that always gets asked, How are you going to pay for that? How how does a bespoke uh, 3D printed Lego style nest box stack up in cost compared to the conventional uh, four-sided lump of wood with a sloping roof? (laughs) Yeah, definitely more expensive. Definitely more expensive than um, slapping six bits of wood together and, and cutting a hollow in it, which... As I say, that sounds very disparaging of the humble nest box that, that is doing a good job for so many species. I guess the, the thing, and, and slower, that they take a lot longer to build than men's sheds and community groups can smash out a whole bunch of traditional nest boxes in a day, and that's a really good exercise. I guess the things to keep in mind are we're talking about species that aren't using the methods yeah. that we're already trying. So you could build 100, 1,000 traditional nest boxes and still not have powerful owls in them. So if this is actually achieving our goal, then it's a step in the right direction. And as um, my PhD student put it the other day, a couple of days is still a hell of a lot faster than the 300 years it's going to take a tree to mature and form the natural hollow that's required. That's right. And there's so many approaches now, like with chainsaw hollows in, into living trees, or the traditional hollows, the, the the PVC pipes, the whole, the, the million, million, maybe 15 or 20 different approaches yeah. that, uh, that are taken that perhaps it's a learned behaviour for some, for some species that they have to get used to these things in the environment before they'll try them. So, so it's maybe not a failure if no one's used it for two years, maybe after, what a powerful owls live, 50 years, 60 yeah. years. So... Just because they're around, they they might not be breeding until they're twenty. So may, maybe it's going to take fifteen years of passing this thing on the side of a tree before they're even going to be interested in, in using it. So we have to get well, we have to get hundreds, if not thousands, of these out there, don't we? Yeah. So that we give them the opportunity. I know. And I, things. I, sorry, I was just going to say things. New things always start out more expensive as well. This is. This is a new technique and part of what we're trying to do is not necessarily say this is the way that nest boxes should be built in the future but encourage people to explore new materials, new ways of building things, new ways of thinking about how we share our urban habitats with wildlife. Um, And there there could be new materials that are, are so cheap and so beautifully insulated that they'll suddenly make this a much easier task. But monitoring is really important. Evaluating how well these things work is really important. It's one thing to come up with a creative new thing to try, but if we're not uh, carefully measuring and evaluating them, then it's not really, you can't call it a success. So, so far we've been testing how well they handle temperature changes and maintaining the internal humidity and all of those things are being monitored you know, as we speak, basically, and we hope to be getting some good results from those soon. But preliminary data shows that they are maintaining a good internal temperature compared to a natural hollow and a chainsaw hollow. So that's really good news. Have, have you got any idea how many of these boxes are are being used? Like is there a percentage success rate that that you've been uh, – I know it's really early days, so it's it's hard to tie it down, but – I imagine that maybe there's only a dozen or so of them out there. So are most of them being being frequented by someone desirable? 
Yeah, most of them have been. We've had species checking them out. We're still going. So we actually had acoustic monitors in them and we're still going through all that data to listen to who was inside the boxes. No powerful owls yet. I definitely know that. But there have been possums and lorikeets and galahs investigating them and being in them, whether or not they've actually then taken the step to nest and produce successful young is the next thing that we need to, to check because ultimately that's what we want. They're for, they're for breeding. It's a, that's what we want to see. That's right. And, I mean, it's really interesting. I'm in the same city as you and I'm always encouraged when I see new birds in the city, but at the same, on the, on the other hand, some of them are not, the birds you would prefer to be in the cities. Like it, it's amazing how many sulfur crested cockatoos have come into into Melbourne, but they're big birds. So that yeah. means they're driving out other birds. And I imagine a pair of cockatoos moving into a large nesting hollow absolutely deter a pair of powerful owls because cockatoos mm. are, are noisy and <laughs> and can be they're not bullies in the same way that that lorikeets are, but cockatoos hang out in flocks of maybe 15, 20, 30. So even when they're breeding, they're still in a group. They're not... Yeah, they're pretty cantankerous. <laughs> yeah, well, they, they, they know how to use their bulk and it's a pretty nasty bite they've got too. So, Kylie, I'm, I'm, I know you're really under the pump today, but I'd love to, I'd love to get you back and talk about red rumps, red rump parrots in the city because... I love watching my local red rumps and trying to understand their movements because they're not here all the time. They do breed nearby, but I don't know where they go. So I'd love to solve that mystery with you. Well, actually, if they're breeding nearby and you know about it, I have a, um, a master's student who would love to hear about that. So he's trying to, we're trying to understand what makes a good home for a, a okay. red rump parrot, what kind of hollow. So Okay. Yeah, if you I, head on over I, to his I, website. <laughs> send me that and I'll publicise that. I haven't been able to find out where they nest, but there are at least two pairs who nest close to, to my place. I see the group or the two groups frequently and just after all the young have fledged, they all hang out together in this small group. Then they disappear and I don't see them again until maybe another four or five months until they... Now, they might be around, but just solo or in pairs and I don't notice them as much and they're not feeding where I hang out. But, yeah, that that They're a nice great. little bird to have in the city. They are. They're, but they don't do much. That's why <laughs> people don't notice them. They don't do much at all. And And I really want you on another occasion, Kylie, to tell us all about the... Fair, the, the Superb Blue Wren, the Fairy Wren project that you've got that you've got going. And of course we've got to talk about Dame Edna. That's yes, a teaser for, uh, for next time. Kylie, what should people do if they see birds, be it owls or parrots that they don't know, they can't identify, maybe using hollows? Is there somebody who wants to know about this data in the suburbs? Oh, you can. I'll just give you my mobile number. No. <laughs> <laughs> Is it? There's so many studies going on. Yeah. I'm just wondering that apart from the the sort of annual bird count that collects sightings, but uh, are there are there people wanting to know about where birds are nesting and utilising in the suburbs? In yeah, absolutely. Oh. There's the Hollows as Homes project is a really good one to go to. So they're trying to bring all of that information together and be a place where people can report their hollow sightings and, and learn a little bit more about how hollows functions and ho as homes for wildlife and what people might be able to do in their own area to, to make better homes for wildlife. Depending on where you live, definitely check out your, your local councils. So councils like the City of Melbourne run, I think, annually hollow blitzes where citizen scientists can go out with them and search all of the hollows and see what's nesting in them and contribute to data that way that helps them manage those urban spaces better for wildlife and maybe the kind of wildlife that you want and less of the kind of wildlife that you don't. Yeah, there's lots of really great initiatives. Okay, so Hollows as Homes, check that out. I'll put all the links. I'm sure Kylie will put me in touch with some people who would like to use the, the data if in Melbourne particularly. And... I'm looking forward to talking to Kylie next time. 
because hopefully we can do this semi-regularly and find out what's going that would on be amazing. In, in, in the city. Kylie, I'm, I don't know if you're up with it, but Holly's back every second Monday this year to talk about birds in backyards and however else we can jam that together. And we've got, we've got on the 28th, we're on the 28th we're talking cockatoos, brush turkeys and bin chickens. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, actually, I've got a got we've got John, of course, John, Doctor John Martin, who's who's our go-to cockatoo behaviour man. But there's somebody in the UK who's been studying cockatoo, cockatoo behaviour. I'm going to wedge her in as well with with John and Holly. So you're more than welcome to join us on any of our of our regular Mondays too, because you've got lots of lots of things to talk about. Been fantastic. This is uh, what are we going to call this segment? Shortcuts. I don't know. That sounds too generic, doesn't it? A wedgie. It's a small wedge. <laughs> the snippet. We'll work on that. We'll come up with something groovy. Yeah. And uh, yeah, great, Kylie. Thanks for talking to us. Kylie, Thank of you. course, is at the University of Melbourne, which I neglected to uh, to say in the introduction. Yeah, well, yeah, well, you, you didn't even put Dr. Kylie on your, I know, on I know. your name badge there. <laughs> but there we go, We're hard-hitting science. We always try and deliver on the bird emergency. Thanks so much, Kylie. It's been fun and I look forward to talking about red rumps and fairy wrens in our next instalment. Sounds perfect. Thanks for watching and listening, everyone. I'm Grant Williams. This has been the Bird Emergency. See ya.